Well, speaking of carrying the message, I can think of no better known, loved, or respected messenger in our circles than Father Martin. It is a very special honor for me to welcome him to High Watch Farm and present him to all of you, Father Martin. If I had known I was going to live this long, I'd have flossed more. (laughs) My first happy task is to uh, let you know there's a lad who works here. His name is uh, Peter, Peter Q. It's his natural birthday and his third anniversary of being here at Iowa. As uh, many of you probably already know, you've seen me stumbling around here. Somebody once asked me about a month ago exactly in a restaurant at home, Father, why do you have that cane? And I said, so I can remain upright. (laughs) You know, as you get older, things happen to you, truly. I mean, right now, going to bed at night begins with a removal of parts. (laughs) These out, these out. I looked over one night, there's more me on the dresser than in the bed. (laughs) I'd like to start with two tales that do have a bearing. There was a doctor who used to leave his office at 5 o'clock every day, walk right across the street to a lovely lounge where the bartender at two minutes past five was just putting his drink on the bar. It was a daiquiri with a stick of cinnamon in it. He would walk in and say to the bartender, good evening, Harry, and begin sipping his drink at exactly quarter past five. uh, He would say, good night, Harry, and leave. That was it, one drink, 16 years. Now, the bartender was using that brand-new bartender's guide, Betty Cooker's crock book. Uh, But anyway, this particular afternoon... Just as he finished making the drink, he discovered that he did not have any cinnamon. And he looked around, there was a little twig of hickory wood. And just as the doctor walked in the bar, he put the twig in the drink and set it down. Doctor walked in, he said, good evening, Harry, and picked the drink up. and Looked at it, he said, well, what in the world is this? And Harry said, that is a hickory daiquiri, Doc. But there's a good story about treatment. Some alcoholics and drug addicts are very clever people. And there was a lad in treatment who was unemployed simply because he was unemployable. But he decided after two weeks that he had enough of the past life, he was going to change. He was going to get a job and go to the top. And the job he decided on is going to be a Bible salesman. There's nobody beating the road to the door, you know, to get it. So after he got out, he got the job. And he set out on a Monday morning with 50 Bibles, 9 a.m. He returned at 2.30, wanted 50 more. He had sold out. Boss didn't believe him. He said, our best man nationally can't sell 50 Bibles in less than two weeks. He gave him the money. He said, here. Now he said, do I get the 50 new Bibles? Well, he said, yes, but how in the world did you sell 50 in a day? He said, my last two weeks of treatment, I developed the perfect Bible selling technique. It's foolproof. I ring a doorbell, and when the lady of the house answers, I I always say, "Uh, uh, lady, would you, would, would, would you, would would you like to, what like 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 to uh, 
Uh, buy a uh, buy, buy, buy. <laughs> Would would you like to buy a buy a buy 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 Bible 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 or 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 or, 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 or would would or, or would you rather rather have me read it to you? <laughs> That's not why I'm here. Is to... What I'd like you to do is listen to, uh, I don't like speakers that read things, but this is brilliant. It's a masterpiece written by the man who saved my life. And it is called The Paradox of the Alcoholic. The alcoholic, of course, is many things, as we all know. He is the world's supreme paradox. He drinks not because he would, but because he must. He does not drink for pleasure. He drinks to pain, yet he drinks. He will mortgage the wealth of the future to pay off the debts of the past so that he may drink up the non-existent present. He's the only one in nature, I think, who seeks stimulation and a sedative, only to find that it acts upon his nerves as excited misery. He seeks to inflate his puny little ego in the provocative wine of Bacchus and succeeds in shriveling his soul in the bitter gall of remorse. He escapes desperately to free himself from the facts of reality and runs headlong into the prison of fantasy. Success is just as fatal as failure to the alcoholic. He will drink with exhilaration to success and to sadness and misfortune. He drinks to get high in the evening, knowing how low he will be in the morning. When the alcoholic smilingly gets to the first drink he can get, he is transported to heaven. And when he is unable to get the last drink he can pour, he is transported to hell. The alcoholic, like most people, thrills to the beauty of life. And then how frequently he seeks the ugliness of existence. When he is sober, he craves to be drunk. When he is drunk, he prays to be sober. Such is the weird paradox of the alcoholic that the only way in which he can feel better is to drink that which makes him feel worse. He starts out on his drinking no matter who he is with all the dignity of a king and winds up his drinking like a clown. So he goes. His incredible incomprehensible, paradoxical way, leaving in his wake his human wreckage, that which he does cherish most. Down the road of alcoholic oblivion, he stumbles and staggers until he either finds himself at the door of AA or death intervenes. I don't know what you heard, but I heard and saw a verbal photograph of my soul on the day I entered treatment. I felt as though many have heard me say this. I had to jump upwards to touch bottom. Everything was at stake, my life, even my priesthood. I was bewildered. Absolutely terrified. And I was able to get well under the guidance of a man who met Bill after he himself got sober when AA was six years old and the big book just two years old. His name was Austin Ripley and he founded a sanatorium for alcoholic priests like me. I was the 80th priest to go through. 
I'm mentioning all of this because in order to know anybody or any institution or any organization, you have to know something of the background, the nature, the purpose. Do you know what treatment was then? Old Doc Green used to explain what was wrong with us in language that we understood. He explained the mystery of addiction so that we could grasp it. And his lectures are the backbone of the chalk talk. And Austin Ripley himself explained AA because he sat at the feet of Bill and Dr. Bob with whom he spent a year in the early years of his own sobriety. And so I always speak with deep conviction about everything connected with this program that saved our lives because it came second hand, Bill and Dr. Bob, to rip to me. He explained AA over and over and over again because he believed that repetition is the mother of learning. He would tell all about Bill and Dr. Bob, whom he knew intimately, and he explained those steps over and over again in that inimitable way of his. He was an unusual man. He was the greatest man I ever knew. He had the soul of a saint, literally and the tongue of a poet. By profession, he was a writer. But Rip, in my seven months of treatment, I love it. You know, all the agony we go through in treatment, we earned that. I love it when people say, I'm going to be away from my family for a whole month. And I always say, oh. I was there for the 4th of July Labor Day, my birthday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's, and I wouldn't have traded a second of it, not a second. And that's why, you know, when some drunks get a little arrogant when they drink and so on, they get into treatment and you hear this, oh, I just can't sleep. And I always say, stay awake. Oh, I'm so nervous. Well, shake. You, you're entitled to it. <laughs> so, there was nothing about my treatment that was painful at all. I loved it. But when he began to, began to fill in the history of Bill Wilson, uh, we couldn't get enough of it. Bill was like you and me. He held a membership card to the human race and he had a terrible drinking problem. He tried this, he tried that, he tried everything. Now look, the conversations that I will share with you, I made them up. I mean, I wasn't there, so I'm making it up. Anyway, he found himself one morning, he was supported by his wife, She'd leave a couple of dollars on the dresser, go over to Manhattan to work to support them, and he would start his drinking and then drink by his wits, I guess, on the rest of the day. And one morning, an old drinking buddy by the name of Ebby Thatcher showed up at their apartment in Brooklyn, and he was dressed very nicely, and uh, Bill offered him a drink. He said, no thanks, I don't drink anymore. He said, what happened to you? And Ebby said, I guess I got God. And he mentioned the, the Oxford groups. And uh, it didn't help Bill right away, but as we say, it was a seed. Rip used to tell us at Guest House, and I think it's good for all of us to know this. He said, Bill scored the touchdown, but old Ebby handed him the ball. He said, every recovered alcoholic and addict on earth owes that man a debt. Poor guy never got sober until nine months before his death. It's one of those tragedies that we will never understand. But I'm sure old Ebby is twelfth stepping from his position in heaven, just as Bill twelfth stepped here on earth. 
Anyway, Bill found himself, as you know, on his last drunk, and he wound up in Towns Hospital under the care of his physician, Dr. Silkworth. Now, here's what I'm making up. He must have said to Dr. Silkworth, look, you know and I know I am not in denial. I know exactly what's wrong with me. I'm drinking myself to death and I can't help it and I want out. And I don't know how to get there. He said, I've tried everything you've suggested and here I am in the hospital again. And then, ladies and gentlemen, prompted by divine grace, I have no doubt in my mind came this question. Imagine it coming from the soul of someone who characterized himself as self-will run riot. He said, I wonder if I might get what I'm after, sobriety and the happiness and the peace that it must bring. Listen to the means. I wonder if I can't get all this by trying to help someone else. Where in God's name did that question come from? From a practicing alcoholic. And Dr. Silkworth, God bless him. He was educated enough to know what he didn't know. And he said, I don't know, Bill. But since nothing beats a trial but a failure, why don't you try? If there are any intellectuals here who are having trouble accepting the steps of AA, please know that there are many signs in it that prove what it is a purely scientifically founded therapy, the most powerful on earth. These men, Bill and Dr. Bob, use nothing but scientific technique. What does medicine do when they're looking for a cure for cancer or emphysema? They go into the lab. They use pure laboratory technique. They accept everything offered, keep what works, and discard what does not. And when Silkworth said, why don't you try, he did. He knew dozens of drunks. And you know the rest of the story. He came home to Lois one day and said... I must have talked to dozens of them. They're still drinking. And her reply was a statement of the obvious. She said, maybe they are, Bill, but you haven't had a drink in six months. He hadn't had six months of continuous sobriety in his adult life. Through pure trial and error, he discovered two things. Number one, what he was doing to help himself trying to help others, was keeping him sober. And the other thing he learned, he was trying to help them by saying, get right with God and you'll be able to handle your drinking problem. And he had the cart in front of the horse. We know that we have to handle our drinking problem in order to get right with God because it is our addiction that separates us from him. And it was Silkworth, God bless him, that said, look, Bob, my whole background is scientific. The next drunk you talk to, why don't you use a scientific approach? I believe that something is physiologically wrong in the bodies of alcoholics. That somewhere along the line, this thing gets triggered, whereby when you take a drink, you want another one. There are those who can drink a beer with a pizza, and that's it. They can have a glass of wine with dinner, and that's it. You and I can't do that. Again, divine providence had it set up that Bill, with his six months of sobriety, was being trusted again, and he had some backers for a business deal in Akron, Ohio, and he went there, and the deal fell through. He was alone. He was away from Lois. She's back in Brooklyn. He was horribly disappointed. He had a kick in the face business-wise. And in the uh, lobby of the hotel, he could hear the ice cubes clinking in the glasses. And ladies and gentlemen, you understand as well as I do, everything in him wanted a drink. Some jackass once said that we alcoholics are a cut above average intellectually. I always look at our patients and say, you're so damn smart, what are you doing here? (laughs) 
Somebody much more accurately described the alcoholic's brain as a BB shot rattling around in a shoebox. <laughs> a, a thought has a tough time finding it. <laughs> but this thought found Bill's BB shot. Buddy boy, by the way, don't ever knock physical sobriety. We say, oh, he's just absent. He's not sober. Give it time, give it time, give it time. Bill's brain was alcohol-free long enough for this thought to take over. Buddy boy, you have one drunk left, your last one. You really don't want to start it, do you? And he ran to the church bulletin and picked a name, Tunks. A father Tunks, an Episcopal priest, and he called him. And again, now I'm making up this dialogue. He said, don't hang the phone up. I'm not a crazy man, even though you may think I am when I ask this question. The only thing he knew that would keep him from a drink was trying to help another drunk. And so he said, do you know a drunk I can talk to? And for his own reasons, which were practically obvious, no priest is going to give the names of people he knows to a stranger. Uh, he denied. He said, no, I don't. Well, he said, do you know anybody connected with the Oxford groups? Gave him a list of ten names. And Bill struck out on the first nine. The tenth name was Henrietta Cyberling. Do you know a drunk I can talk to? She said, yes, an old family friend, a proctologist named Dr. Bob Smith. Now, in my limited experience in the medical field, I just believe that all proctologists should drink. <laughs> he said, may I talk to him? She said, well, he's too drunk. And she set up an appointment the next day. And AA was born in her kitchen. I think that the early days of AA should teach us plenty. Watch the way this man approached the drunk. Have you ever heard this or have you ever said it? You hear a guy in AA say, oh yeah, the fellow two doors down from me got a hell of a drinking problem. But he knows where I am when he's ready. Well, you'll go to his grave to attend his funeral in nine cases out of ten. Let's go back to the beginning of AA. Dr. Bob, the suffering alcoholic, did not call Bill Wilson. Bill, the sober alcoholic, looked him up to save his own neck. Now, please, don't get me wrong and don't misinterpret me. I am not suggesting that you're supposed to go two doors down and wrap a guy over the head, tie him up and bring him to AA, or go into bars and do the same. It takes experience, prudence, common sense. When someone that you feel is ripe you should intervene and let him know that you know. He may tell you off. He may confine you to the pit of hell. But he knows in his guts that you care. And if he throws you out of his house, that may be quite predictable. But he may come your way two years from now instead of 12 years from now when the going does get tough. Watch the way the first AA meeting was conducted. They met in Henrietta's kitchen. And Bill approached him this way, Doctor, I hear you have trouble with your drinking. Yes, I do. Let me tell you about me. Let me tell you about my drinking problem. And it opened Dr. Bob up like a clam. Ladies and gentlemen, he had never been approached that way before. Never. He had been scolded, reprimanded, questioned, you know, name it. We've all been through it. 
Bill Wilson said, let me tell you about my problem. And Dr. Bob was so impressed by that, this man going over his drinking problem in an almost clinical way, he was prompted to do the same thing. And hours and hours went by, and these two men placed the rubble of their lives on the table. And poking around in it, they found each had two things in common. When I drank, I didn't control it. It controlled me. And it caused problems. If you can associate drinking with any major life problem, you have a drinking problem. We call it alcoholism. You can call it whatever you want. In April of a school year, they flew me from St. Joseph's College in Mountain View, California, to St. Charles College in Baltimore, Maryland. of the nation because I ate too many French fried potatoes. <laughs> it was alcohol. The obvious becomes so obvious when we kick ourselves or get kicked in the head with it. Down at Ashley, we're in the pathway of Canada geese. They go through there and so on. And all through the fall and winter, these beautiful V formations of geese go over. And I remember one day after lunch, a couple of fellows and I came out from lunch and there were about four or five of these formations flying over. And I said, you know, if I live to be 8,000, that'll always touch my heart. And one of them said, you ever notice, Father, it's never a perfect V? One side's always longer than the other. I said, yeah, why? He said, there are more geese on that side. <laughs> The obvious, the obvious. What's all that have to do with us? The rest obviously is history. They reached out to another drunk and through trial and error, they came to these steps. I remember at a clergy conference in New York 40 years ago, I met Bill. It was, it was a very profound experience. Uh, somebody asked him if a Jesuit seminarian helped him write the steps because they so closely resemble the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. And he smiled. He said, no, Father, I wrote them. It took me about a half hour. What he did, <laughs> now he didn't create them in a half hour. He took all that they had and condensed them for print in the big book. Please notice if there are any here with a scientific bent of brain. They are not theoretical. If you do this, this might happen. They are written as fact in the past tense. We did this. This did happen. Not a syllable has been changed in over 60 years. My God. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that screwballs, lunatics, thieves, robbers, uh, embezzlers, murderers like you and me <laughs> have been fooling around with them at AA meetings for over 60 years and they're still the same? <laughs> Doesn't that say something? Doesn't it say something? If not, it should. It has rubbed off into various other human problems. N.A., G.A., gambling, O.A., overeating, and even E.A., emotions anonymous. And it has proven quite effective. The paradox of A.A. is that Bill had to start with the 12th step. He didn't know it at the time in order to discover the first 11. And there's not a thing in A.A. that is new Nothing. My mother lived AA, never heard of it. Trust God, steps 1, 2, and 3. Clean house, steps 4 through 11. 
help others. Step 12. Those three relationships, the only ones we can have with God, self, and others, uh, are rebuilt through these steps. And there are certain notions, I think, that have to be corrected, and I learned this from Rip. Have you ever heard this piece of insanity? Well, we're all only a drink away from a drunk, so the sober sky in the room is the one that got up earliest. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if some are sicker than others, that means that the others are weller. <laughs> yes, we're all only a drink away from a drunk, but some people are a whole lot farther away than others. I would far rather place my life in the hands of some poor guy who didn't get up till 1 o'clock this afternoon because after 33 years of sobriety he was trying to get a drunk into a hospital last night than some clown that got up at 4.30 this morning because drunk the night before his nerves woke him up. How can we make such stupid statements? Sobers man in the rooms when he got up earliest. This thing's supposed to get weller as time goes by. Most important person here is the new person. No, he's not. I am. It has nothing to do with pride. It has nothing to do with conceit. Ladies and gentlemen, you better get it into your head that you are your most and first responsibility before the throne of God, so am I. When I die, he's going to ask me if I've helped any drunks, but he is not going to ask me that first. He's going to say, Sonny boy, did you die sober? That's what he's going to ask you and you and you and all of you. Not the new person. I, did you notice we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves? Proper self-love. Doing the things that's going to salvage my life and enable me to stand and render an account of it before the throne of God when it's over. That's the important thing. A hierarchy of values. First things, ladies and gentlemen, really do come first. And you are. And your sobriety. High watch gets no one sober. They look you right in the eye and say, we're going to equip you with the tools and the equipment that are going to help you get you sober. Every Friday when we have a graduation at Ashley, I always say, when I am asked, what is Ashley's success rate? I say it's 100%. We give you the best that's in us. Now, what's your rate of success? The ball is in your court. The ball is in your court. Uh, There are just several things. We had a picture of the suffering alcoholic in Rip's magnificent portrait, The Paradox of the Alcoholic. I saw the film Patton 11 times. Next time it's on, I'll probably watch it again. Do you remember how that opened? The general uh, spoke to his troops in an airplane hangar in England before D-Day, night before D-Day. And he opened with this statement. He said, no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. We win wars by making some other dumb bastard die for his country. And there was something in those words that hit me about us. And after the second or third time I saw that film, I was reading the breviary, the priest's prayer book. And in it are these lines in one of the Psalms. My neighbors stand afar off because of my affliction. Those closest to me treat me like a leper. And then it hit me. You and I, through our addiction, had become the illegitimate children of humanity. 
We were the bastards of God's children. And very few people wanted to have anything to do with us. Because we were not very likable. The next time I saw Patton, this is the way I heard it. No alcoholic bastard ever won the war against this disease by dying for it. We win the war by making some other poor, dumb, stinking, puking, alcoholic bastard live. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. We are commissioned by the 12 steps of our therapy. We are commissioned to help bring that about. Sometimes I think in our meetings we talk gratitude to death. And I believe AA looks us in the eye and says, don't tell me, show me. One time there was a meeting in Baltimore of a fellow who talked about gratitude for an entire hour at the Saturday night meeting, had the room in tears. Three hours later, he was awakened by a phone call that said, you put your name on a 12-step list, there's a guy in your neighborhood needs help. Will you go? And this was the answer. I'm tired. Gratitude is not a feeling. It's an action. It's an action. I've about come to the end of what I have to say. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone at High Watch, Janine and the rest, and Lou Battle for setting this up, to grant me one of the supreme honors of my own sobriety is to come and share an anniversary with you. You know, in John Donne's famous poem, No Man is an Island, he said, when you hear a funeral bell, ask not for whom the bell tolls, tolls for thee. Every time a human dies, a little bit of each of us dies, for we are brother and sister to one another. I turn that coin over. Every time something good happens, every time a life is created, a life of sobriety, I feel that we all share in that. Can you imagine the sobriety that we are all celebrating here? It's a magnificent thing. And I am thrice blessed to be a part of it, and I thank all of you for that. But you will know that every day is not Christmas in AA. We have our ups and downs. Some of them are very painful indeed. But there's a, a short poem that kind of uh, expresses my own feelings. I do not wish you joy without a sorrow nor endless day without the healing dark, nor brilliant sun without the restful shadow, nor tides that never turn against your bark. I wish you faith and strength and love and wisdom, goods, gold enough to help some needy one, I wish you songs, but also blessed silence and God's sweet peace when every day is done. And I wish you the peace of God that only a day like this can give us as you close your little eyes and place your little heads on your little pillows when you go home to bed. And always remember, where there's a will, there's relatives.